Hello everybody, this is Theron. Welcome to Minecraft Maker. And today we're doing something a little different. I've got a, I'm in a creative world here. And I'm going to show you something that I've been working on for, for quite some time, uh, off and on. And I don't really have a presentation figured out yet. And this is part of what I'm trying to do is figure out my presentation. And so I figured what I'd do is kind of go through it here. With dogs barking in the background. Shush! They're not coming to get you. It's okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, this is part of a, uh, a, a, a lesson plan, a class that I'm planning on doing for introduction to programming. Teaching people who know nothing about how to program how to program and the first part not all of it but the first part is basically going to be done here in a minecraft world to show what i think is kind of an important piece of the whole puzzle which is you need to figure out or you need to have an understanding of what goes on inside a computer or what is inside a computer so this is my sort of stylized um overly simplified representation of what is inside a computer. And we have a monitor and keyboard here, which is probably the most recognizable part. <laughs> uh, I'm going to move this, I think, because it doesn't, it's, it's, eh, it's in the wrong place. And I'll explain what I'm going to do uh, over here instead of this. But this is my representation of what's inside a computer. It's pretty simple. There's only a really a few things you need to have an actual computer. One is you need a processor, which I'm showing here as a kind of a hybrid factory and a computer chip. See the black, uh, the black computer chip with the little legs? Boop. So this is the processor. And you think of it basically where all the work gets done. It's really just a glorified calculator. Oops, uh, get out of there. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do something on the inside here or not. Probably, I need to put some additional doors, and I don't know if I'm going to put them on the outside here or on the inside. I'm not sure yet. But, processor. This is kind of important. It's an important piece of it. But it's not the only piece that matters. <sighs> These, I made the ground all this, I think this is clay, right? Hardened clay, lime colored clay, and gold blocks. And the reason for that was, was because it kind of looks like a computer circuit board, like an old school computer circuit board. They're not all green and, and gold anymore. Uh, they come in a wide variety of colors now, but uh, back in the day, this is what computer circuit boards, they kind of looked like. And the, the gold traces, and it was actually gold, that they used, that was where the electricity went. And the computer works, it transfers information around inside the computer by sending electrical signals along these traces. And really, the computer only knows whether or not there's data coming through if it comes along at certain points on these traces at certain times and that the times are controlled by the clock so there's a clock inside the computer that ticks away goes tick 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 in a modern computer that that thing you know, when you buy a computer and you say oh it's a three gigahertz processor well that's the, the the gigahertz is talking about how fast the clock is how many times per second it clicks or it ticks a, a three gigahertz processor the clock inside it ticks three billion times a second. Three billion. That's a three with nine zeros after it. That's really fast. It goes all the time. And so basically, uh, the signals get sent along, boop, 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 boop. And then when the clock ticks, tick. If, it's, if the signal's at this point, if there's an electrical signal at this point when the clock ticks, that's, that's a signal. That's, that's a one. Hang on a second. Hey, guys, shush, shush, shush. I'm sorry. I'm home a little early. It's, it's about the time of uh, um, 
about time of day that people start taking their dogs in the neighborhood for a walk. So uh, this, uh, so these pathways are what we uh, call the bus. And uh, so I'm using the little minecart to sort of illustrate the bus, but it kind of goes along, brings data to and from the processor. And where does it go to? Well, A, we have information coming from the clock, the tick, 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 tick. And we have the processor. And this is the memory. So now you buy a computer and it probably comes with eight or 16 gigs of RAM. That RAM, random access memory, is this. This is my sort of illustration of what RAM is like. And it's, it's basically a series of houses. And the houses each store data. And they each have an address. So here, see I've got zero and one and two and some places like a lot of cities in the u.s they'll uh, the the address is kind of flip-flop sides of the street not the case here it just counts along new progressively come up here to seven and then it goes on we've got multiple rows here and in fact this would be lots and lots of rows that 16 gigabytes of ram is 16 billion bytes. So it'd be 16 billion of these houses. I'm not gonna build 16 billion houses because you, you can get the idea with this. Uh, <clears throat> and But the important thing is that each one has its own address and they're kind of in order. Hey. So the processor, as I said, it's basically just a calculator. It can add numbers and subtract numbers and multiply and divide. It can do all the math functions like a calculator can, and it can read data out of the memory. It can say, hey, what's in this house here? What's in house, house nine? And it can get the data and bring it in here. And it can say, oh, what's in house one? get the data there and then it can add those two numbers together and then it can go write the write that data out to house six out to house six uh, so it can read memory it can write memory it can compare memory it can say hey if if what's in house zero is the same as house one do this and if it's different do that so these the houses can contain not only data like numbers it can also contain instructions for what the computer needs to do next. So that's what that's what memory is for is really just instructions and data. Um, and the calc and the uh, the CPU can really only it follows those instructions and the number of instructions that it has that it can do is really really minimal. Um, modern processors have more instructions that they can do, but really they're just uh, doing the simpler instructions over and over. And so it can read and write from memory, follow instructions, compare memory, write and, you know, do calculations right out to memory. And then it can ha and then it can do one of a couple things with that data. It can write it out to a hard disk. And this is a really goofy illustration of a hard disk. Um, what's inside a hard disk is series of platters and then arms with heads, reed heads on it. Um, this is, and, and roughly the stack of, of cylinders like this is what uh, hard disk drives and uh, schematic diagrams look like. So that's kind of what I'm trying to represent here. But it doesn't have to be a spinning hard disk. It could be a solid state drive. It could be a flash. It could be a USB stick. It could be lots of different things. Uh, just it's storage. One thing to keep in mind about memory is when the power it, it when the power goes out it loses it forgets. That's a good way of putting it. So when the computer's running, it's constantly sending a voltage to each of these memory locations that causes it to refresh and remember whether or not you know what the value is, what the data inside this memory location is, what this memory address is, and when that power disappears everything blacks everything blanks out you lose it all but if you write it out to storage device like a hard drive or a sd card or or a or like a cd drive a cd disc 
solid state drive, one of those things. It writes it out there and even when the power is off, it remembers. Some computers, well most computers, also have what they call non-volatile RAM, which is memory like this, but there's a battery on it constantly supplying a little bit of energy to it to keep it, keep it, keep it uh, refreshed. And that's often where they'll store things like settings for the basic settings for the computer, like what to do when you turn it on and, uh, and the date and time. Uh, not as important now that uh, the date and time used to be a big thing that when you had when your battery on your battery backup memory died, and you had to go reset like they would come up and it would think that it was you know 1901 or whatever it, it, it had the wrong it always would have the wrong date and you'd have to set it every time you turned on the computer most computers now are connected to the internet all the time and they uh they don't need that anymore so it's not as critical for that for the battery backup memory but it is a thing so and then the other place the data could come to go to or come from is what we call I.O. or input output. And the most basic form of that is your keyboard and your and your computer screen. Of course, you might have a, monitor, a mouse or trackpad on a laptop. This could also be a printer. It could also be uh, um, audio, like an audio jack. Uh, so uh, speakers, let's just call it speakers. Could be a variety of things, but it's the way the computer interacts with the outside world. So this is not really inside the computer, it's just connected to the computer. I wanted to illustrate that here. One other thing I need to do, well, I might move this so that it's over here and facing that way. So that you can sit here and I could build a, like a case around the whole thing. So the keyboard and monitor are here and then you have to go on the other side of it in order to get inside the computer. Because the other thing that I need to put in is the power supply, which supplies power, <laughs> strangely enough, to the whole shebang. It supplies power that the, uh, it supplies the voltage that the, uh, the data uses to send signals around inside the computer to and from the CPU. It, and it supplies power needed to spin up the hard drives it supplies the power needed to tick the clock and it supplies the power needed to um, read and write stuff from memory most as I said the computer basically knows there's a signal like if there's a voltage a voltage someplace at a certain time that's how it knows where the, whether or not there's a, a signal whether there's a one and when there's no voltage there at that time at a given time it's a zero and what that voltage is varies processor to processor most modern processors that voltage is about three volts it's usually 3.3 volts it can however be anything and in some cases it's five volts in some cases it's there's there's some that have really wacky voltages uh, like 12 volts or 10 volts and most old Old school power supplies have two rails, one that's five volts and the other that's that's 12 volts. And the computer sort of takes that and adjusts it to the level that it needs. But most computer processors now are 3.3 volts. That's what they call their logic level. And the reason that they're a funky, funky value, 3.3 volts, I don't know where the 3.3 volts comes from, but the reason being that it's not five volts five volts would be nice and convenient because so much else on the computer is five volts the power supply probably operates on five volts your usb ports output five volts five volts would be super super convenient but by going with a lower voltage it actually reduces the power consumption on the whole computer and that's kind of a big part of processor design and computer design and it's important if you have a laptop say where you're going to be operating it off of battery a lot of the time so the processor draws if it only draws three volts it uh the battery will last longer and and everything else uh it'll run at a cooler temperature because the amount of power uh that a a power is expressed in terms of a unit called watts and uh, so your voltage and times the current is your is your wattage is your power 
and uh, oh, that's that's weird. There's a little outline around my hand, um, and so the power and the the more power that a, an electrical device uses, uh, it's it's a con it's a measure of consumption. So it's actually it'll be cheaper to run with if it's lower power, and it'll generate less heat. Generally speaking because no electronic device is 100% efficient. So if you go and uh, if you run it off of a lower voltage, that means the wasted energy is going to generate less heat. So less heat, which is good, especially in like data centers where you have thousands and thousands of computers, every bit of heat that those computers put out have to be managed Otherwise, the excess heat, if it builds up too much, can actually damage the computers or damage the hard drives. So they have to counteract that heat by running air conditioning, which costs additional money and generates more heat. It just generates the heat outside the building. And uh, all that stuff is not good for the environment. And it's expensive. So if you can do it cheaper and do it with less heat, it's good for everybody. Uh, so I, I suspect at some point in the future, a processor power consumption, the, the logic level, the typical logic level will probably reduce even below 3 volts. But at the moment, 3.3 is typical. So I think that's basically it here. Oh, the, so the last thing, the reason, part of the reason I'm thinking of moving this is I need to put in the power supply, which I'm probably going to build right over here, like in front of right here sort of pointing towards this and this and i think the power the power thing i'm going to do is going to be like a big battery like the kind of battery that you have on your 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 phone or your camera where it's like a little it looks like a little miniature like double a battery and it's got the little slashes in it uh to show you how full it is probably going to put in one of something like that like a big double a battery right here pointing towards this and then it'll connect into this trace here. And that'll be that. And then I'll move this, the keyboard and monitor, and I'll stick it over here facing the other way. So it kind of shows that it's not really inside the computer, but it's kind of the computer talks to it. And I think that will pretty much take care of it. And so my idea is to get across how, what actually goes on inside the computer how few things are actually necessary for it to be a computer and get across the notion of moving data around. I'll probably extend these houses. I'll probably just clone out more of them out that way uh, because I need to, the important thing is I need to get across the notion that each one of these memory locations has an address. It's super important. And the notion that some addresses, some houses, you know, you know how like, some places they get all pretentious and they and they give it a name like Wayne Manor or <clears throat> or you know the Chrysler Building. <laughs> um, so these houses will sometimes also have a name, and that name is effectively what we call is what we call a variable. So if we say I want to have a I want to have a, a chunk of memory where I'm counting the number of um, the number of blocks in the world or the location of you know these all this information on the debug screen here so the xyz values those are all numbers that are stored in a variable in the computer memory so we'd say oh this one and maybe it's actually and it's not always just one because this would be one byte and so that number might actually take up four bytes of memory and so these four these four houses all become x the next four become Y and the next four become Z and so on. Um, so the computer, when you're programming it, you don't actually put in and say, oh, here, stick X in this, you know, in this memory location. Um, instead, you say, give me a chunk of memory that I will call X and give me a chunk of memory I'll call Y and a chunk of memory I'll call Z. And then the computer allocates some section of memory for you and that becomes uh, that becomes your variable and that's where that that number is stored and one of the reasons that we use variable names is to make it easier for human beings to track this stuff but also 
because the computer, the operating system that drives the whole computer might decide at some point, oh, you know what? I really need these four houses for something else. So I'm going to take the data that's stored in them and I'm going to relocate. I'm going to move that variable to some other place in memory. And then the next time the, the program calls for X, it just goes and grabs it from the other from the other location. So it basically the data moves and then it updates the phone book that contains all the addresses. And the computer still knows where to get the data. Your program doesn't have to know exactly where it is in memory, or at least doesn't need to know where it is in memory at all times. It might want to be able to do something with that memory, but it uses the variable name. So that's one concept that I wanted to be able to get across, the idea that you could name addresses, give them names. So we'll call that one Wayne Manor, and maybe that's four houses. So I hope that all makes sense. I'll probably come back, I'll probably make some adjustments here and come back and sort of do this again. Um, and so my goal here, I do like the fire on top of the stacks of the factory. Um, my goal here, is to be able to use this as part of a class that I teach to people to learn so that they can learn how to program. And uh, I had mentioned doors inside the processor. Uh, there are special memory locations inside the processor called registers. And so I don't know if I'll just put doors inside here and call them like R0, R1, R2, and so on. Uh, or if I put them on the outside and put traces from them to here, maybe, I don't know, maybe you put them in between the leads here or put them right in here. I don't know. Um, cause that's an, that's, that's a important part to some extent of the way processors work, but I don't know. I'll have to figure that out. Um, don't need to figure it out right now. I was trying to get multiple minecarts running here and it looks like, wow, it looks like they got, uh, oops. There we go. Oh, lever. Where's the minecart? So the first part I would I would show here. Oh, here's the minecart. <laughs> Let's make sure it still works properly. Uh, so the first part I would show here to sort of say, hey, here's what the inside of the computer functionally looks like. I'm not saying this is exactly what the inside of a computer looks like. Although if you look at a processor, the the die of the processor that sort of shows um, <clears throat> that that they use. Oh, it still works good. Uh, that they use to make the processor chips. If you look at them under a microscope, they do actually look like giant cities. They look like maps, but that's neither here nor there. So I think that's it for now. As I said, this is a little preview. I'll, I will probably come back and do this again. And then I'm sort of free forming or winging it right now. And I'll probably do that the next time as well. And then I'll probably take the bits that I think work. I'll listen back to it and take the bits that I think work and start to build that into a presentation. And then from there, I need to go on to the next, the next piece, which is talking about data representation, the notion of uh, ones and zeros inside the computer and how we use them to represent letters and numbers and other bits of information. Um, it's actually a little, it's, it's seriously important part of programming. And then, uh, then I'll sort of step into using an actual programming language to take all these different concepts and show how they're, how they're represented inside the programming language. But that's that. I will probably um, make videos of all of these and put it up as a, as a course on YouTube because uh, I think it potentially could be a useful thing. Um, the reason being that I... I've been trying to wrap things up here, but let me tell the story. When I was a kid, when I was eight or nine years old, hang on a second. Uh, when I was, when I was a kid, eight or nine years old, 
my dad brought home a computer and he worked on the one second please <laughs> okay <clears throat> uh, my dad brought home a computer he he worked when he before he retired he worked as a uh, computer systems analyst at a time when that was actually like a job description um basically it's what we call programmers or engineers or system architects today he kind of did all of it because he knew how to take uh, a company's business needs and get them put onto a computer and built up in a way that made uh made sense for them so that they could track their orders or track their inventory or track their payroll or whatever. Um, and when he started, he was working on big mainframe computers because that's all that existed. And when they started selling small personal computers, he brought one home. And the first one he brought home was a Sinclair Z80. So it was a Z80 based computer hooked up to your TV, had a little um, membrane um, keyboard which was really hard to type on and it had I can't even remember how much RAM it had but it had really tiny amount of RAM it was like a quarter of a K it was uh, it was hundreds of bytes it wasn't even like kilobytes and it had no storage in order to actually instead of having a hard drive what you had to do is get your own tape recorder and hook it up to an output an audio output and you could save your program and it would record it onto the audio tape as sounds and then you can try and load that back in. And it, you, the success rate of saving and successfully reloading was really low. So you got into the habit of saving out your program like two, three times in a row, hoping that one of them would actually load up properly when you, came, when you tried to pull it back in. But it was a great way to learn how to start programming in a uh, programming language called BASIC. And then in uh, 1978, summer of 1978 no no summer 1979 uh, parents sent us off to summer camp me and my sister and uh one of the reasons that they wanted to do that was so that my dad could buy a new computer he bought an apple II plus and he wanted at least a week of time playing with it because he knew once i got home um i would be i would be monopolizing that computer as much as i could and uh he was right so 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 i came home and he showed me how to use it and i had still had a couple weeks of summer left to uh play around with it and one of the first things i did uh it also did not have a hard drive it had two floppy disk drives because hard drives hadn't really been invented yet at least not in the way that we think of them today and one of the first things i did was accidentally formatted the floppy drive that had the system on it and i was i was convinced because i knew basically without that the computer wouldn't do anything it just wouldn't work so i was convinced that my dad was going to come home and he was going to kill me like literally and uh so he came home and i i very sheepishly told him what i did and he laughed and he said you don't think i would have left you <laughs> with the only copy of that disc to you, which taught me a really good lesson of keeping backups of things. So anyway, so I learned uh, how to program a slightly different flavor of basic on the Apple. And uh, they also had a, we also had the language card, which was also a Z80 processor. So it was like a computer that lived inside the Apple computer, it gave you a little bit more RAM. Instead of having 48K of RAM, you had 64K. And uh, it would all, it would let you run another operating system called CPM, which is a fascinating story in and of itself, and I'm not going to go into here, um, but I will at some point, either here or on the uh, my podcast that I'm working on. But uh, we also had a different language, uh, computer programming language, on that was available that would run on that language card, which was called Pascal. So I started to learn Pascal, and that got me pretty far along through junior high and high school. 
And then uh, when I started after in college, I was spending a lot of time working with a Macintosh program called HyperCard. The, uh, the scripting language that ran underneath that was called uh, HyperTalk. And it was actually a very, um, it was very closely related to another programming language that kind of still exists called Smalltalk, um, which is a, a much more sort of English language uh, English natural language sort of looking programming language. And along the way I'd experimented with a few other things like Forth and uh, Logo and uh, a few others. But it wasn't until I was out of school and working at a company called Philips doing interact in their interactive uh, media division. And uh, I was working with one of the I was working in the test department and I was trying to get a job in one of these software developers and they kept asking me, do you know C, which is a different programming language, which I didn't understand, which I didn't know, but I'm, I was thinking to myself, eh, I know several programming languages. How hard could it be? So I, so I told one of them and they, yeah, but I can learn it this weekend. And they laughed at me. So I was at that time, I didn't have a car. So I was walking home and walked past a, I think it was a bookstore or Barnes and Noble bookstore that had a, you know, a small technical book section. And I went in there and found a book called the C programming language by Kernighan and Ritchie. And that looked promising. And it turned out that that was a really good choice for picking up a, a book to learn C because it was written by the guys who actually created the language. And it was the book that defined the language. So was able to pick up uh, I was able to pick up the the book went home and I had on my Macintosh I had in addition to a Pascal compiler I also had a C compiler so I uh, I was able to go through and whoops hey come back here ah that's super loud though hang on a second so I was able to go through that process and learn, uh, learn C, and I did learn it over the weekend. But there was one chapter that I had to re, like reread, like three times, in order to get it. And it was the it was a chapter on pointers and handles, and it was super important. And it was all about this, all about memory and the notion of memory. You know, having an address and how you referred to how you refer to your variables because you could refer to them by their name or sometimes in C you might want to refer to the you want might want to say well here's the address of that variable so there's a different way to refer to it that way it's called dereferencing and uh, it was all very important to to C as a programming language and once I reread it a couple times and it and it dawned on me what was going on and it and it re and I realized that everything I was doing programming regardless of the language I was basically basically all the programming language could do all C could do is uh, read and write data from memory and add you know basically do basic math with it and that the memory could also contain instructions and that basically was all there was to it and I realized that everything that I learned, all the other programming languages that I knew were the same thing. They just were trying to make it easier by adding more features and adding more, uh, more you know, things you could do. But they were basically just doing different permutations of those few basic things that were possible. And so part of what I want to do here is get across to people the notion of what is actually going on, how little there is that the computer itself can actually do, because that's kind of important. And then, and then introduce, oh, hello, Rain. Introduce the basic uh, concepts of uh, computer syntax and variables and data types and things like that in that context that I think it'll be easier for people to understand that and then they can choose which language they want to learn to go actually learn it and do it with the with the concept of it's all just data and moving data around inside the computer uh so that's that's the plan
it was a little long-winded and I hadn't planned on telling that story but that's that's what there is um, and fortunately most of the programming languages that are around today are derivatives or call them uh, dialects of C they're very similar they use basically the same programming language you know structures as C um, but they add features to it because C is it's a little bit difficult to do some basic things you have to kind of do a lot of stuff manually and other programming languages like C++ or C Sharp or um, Perl or Python um, Java JavaScript all of these add features that that people might you know might think to themselves oh it'd be really nice if C had better string handling capability so they go and add those sorts of things so once you learn one of these languages you can really start to you can pick up and, and figure out any of the other languages that are part of the same family which is good because uh, there's a lot to choose from but there aren't any really crazy languages that are common uh, that aren't part of the C family because that's how much sense the C programming language made um, in 1972 when it was devised so so anyway uh, that's the plan as I said I'll probably record this as a video series on YouTube here uh, but uh, hope you found this at least informative and uh, uh, there will be more to come and so if you're interested just keep watching and uh, I will uh, keep making videos like this and hopefully some of you can actually learn how to program. All right, uh, I think that's it for now. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. All right, bye.